Okay, this is uh, Constitutional Convention Part 1. I don't know how many parts it'll take to do this. I usually spend about two days in a face-to-face -face class on it. <clears throat> I'm going to be sending you more to the supplements, I think, and just hit the high points here. Um, so, uh, this is the last major heading in Unit 2, Revolutionary Era. And uh, the first part of it, I recommend you keep this thing, you know, it's the class notes worksheet for unit two. This will help you keep track of exactly where we are and what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, the background of the Constitutional Convention, I'm going to send you to the supplement for that. I think that's going to be easier for you to understand just reading about it. There's other stuff. The rest, most, much of the rest of it, you need to both read about it and hear me tell you about it. Which one comes first? Um, doesn't matter that much. Probably reading it would be uh, would be good because this is called reinforcement. It's going to help a lot. The idea here is that you don't just get a notation in a record book somewhere. You learn things. What a concept. Okay. Next thing here, when and where did the convention take place? It took place in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It lasted from May 25th to September 17th. That's about the same length of time a fall semester would last. I've had a student or two over the years writing essays where it looked like they thought it started in the morning and finished in the afternoon and got it done in a day. So get past that. It took several months for it to happen. It took place in the same building and as far as we know the same room in uh, what is now called Independence Hall in Philadelphia where the Second Continental Congress had declared independence some 11 years earlier. Okay, now, uh, who was there? Char characterized the convention delegates in terms of how many there were, typical profile, education, training, background, experience. All right, they're not a cross-section of the population. This just reflected the, the culture at the time, and some people might be tempted to project on them the standards, if you can call them that, of our own day and find them wanting, but... That doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, they're all white. They're all men. They tend to be well-educated. Only, uh, I'll say, strike only. <laughs> Almost half of them were college-educated, which meant that uh, uh, they're probably they're well-read. It meant more to be college-educated then than it does now, I'm afraid. They understood arguments when they heard them. They were familiar with the writings of, of various political commentators. So... Uh, they're neither uh, cynical, nor I forget what the other word was, as they're characterized by one of the historians I read about this. Okay, um, some think they're all rich men, that this whole constitution was just something foisted off on the poor by the rich. That does not withstand close inspection. According to a historian named Charles Mee, M.W.E., um, he tells us that about 10 of them would, would really be considered wealthy. About another 10 would be well off. It's not quite wealthy, but certainly above the average. Uh, many of them were men of little more than ordinary means, and a few of them, a, a few of them were practically, uh, practically in poverty. Okay, um, they represented various professions, uh, and it's hard to classify some of them because some were bivocational or multivocational. But there were, there were more lawyers than anything else. And whatever you think of the legal profession, that would be the profession best suited to prepare someone to engage in this kind of work. But you also had uh, uh, farmers, you had businessmen, you had a few, uh, you know, clerics and uh, educators and such as that, mainly lawyers, okay? Um, they're sometimes called <clears throat> the framers, and that's a carpentry term. Framers frame out a building. They're framing out a building. The government of the United States, so it's a direct uh, transfer there. <coughs> um, and sometimes they're called the founding fathers, which always gave me a kind of mental image of these doddering graybeards, uh, but that wouldn't work either. <laughs> um, they... Uh, there's something I left out up front, but anyway, I'll get back to it. 
they weren't that old by today's standards. In our own day, and actually over the time it's existed, which is now two and a third centuries, the average age of members of the United States Senate is um, 51. Uh, the average age of, uh, well, actually it's about closer to 55. Average age of members of the U.S. House of Representatives is about 45. Average age of U.S. presidents upon taking the oath of office for the first time, they don't count if it's more than one, <coughs> 51, that's where I got the 51. Average age of delegates to the Constitutional Convention, if you leave out Franklin, who skews the thing all by himself, 42. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, at 81, was the oldest, and he was, like I said, 81 years old. He was not in good health. If this thing had not occurred in his hometown, he couldn't have made it. Uh, he would be carried into the session in what was called a sedan chair. It's like a looks like a stagecoach without wheels. There'd be long poles on both sides, and <clears throat> they'd roust out some prisoners from the local jail to carry him in there. And he was generally too old to rise and speak. If he had wanted to make a speech, he would hand a written copy of it to to uh, someone else to read for him. Um, put him in the mix, and it jacks up the average age all the way to like 45. The youngest was Jonathan Dayton, who was only 26. And there was another delegate from South Carolina who envied that distinction and tried to tell everybody he was just 24 when he was older than that. So this, this is a young group by today's standards. People uh, didn't live as long in those days. They uh, reached ages of, uh, of uh, power and influence at earlier ages. Thomas Jefferson was not there. He was over in Paris serving as diplomat. He, got a letter from probably James Madison informing him of who'd been chosen. He ex expressed relief that it was such a mature gathering. Okay, um, I left out the question of number. Twelve of the states selected a total of, I think, 74 men to go. That they would not have crossed their minds to appoint, to appoint a woman. That That's just how things were in those days. It doesn't cost anything because I don't know that there are any male versus female issues involved there and I don't know that there are any that I would recognize today. No, only 55 ever showed up. So 19 people who were chosen didn't go for various reasons. Uh, but they, they didn't do it. Of the 55 who attended, um, it's kind of come and go at the edges. You've got uh, some that were there early and left for various reasons. Some just didn't like the way things were going, packed their bags and skedaddled. Others didn't get there till late. New Hampshire's delegation didn't arrive until August. Either they were late selecting them or late voting them travel expense money. They didn't get there till the party's almost over. So there only 30 of them attended every session. Average number in attendance, probably in the low to mid 40s. I don't really know. I'm guessing about that one. <clears throat> so uh, there you go. Now, that's that's not all. Most of them had held government positions. That's what, you know, put them in the limelight enough to get chosen to go to a thing like that. Uh, some had been colonial, uh, they'd been members of the Continental Congress, state assemblies, Articles Congress. There are two or three members of the Articles Congress there instead of up in New York twiddling their thumbs. Um, some had been governors of their states, and I think at least two state governors attended uh, and attended the convention. So, and a good many of them, I don't know the number, had helped write their state constitutions. You cannot trump, you cannot top that kind of experience of having written a constitution when no constitutions have been written before. <laughs> you're making this up so you see what and, th and then you get it adopted and you hold office under that constitution it's like building a machine and see if it's seeing if it'll run so you come to Philadelphia with an improved perspective on what works what doesn't what could be improved on and what you might as well not even bother about so you could have found 54 more men who, uh, who could have matched that kind of experience okay what major revolutionary leaders attended? There were only two. George Washington was there, and Benjamin Franklin was there. Now, Washington um, 
Washington had friends who counseled him to hold back. Because this is risky. If you go to that thing and it doesn't do anything, if it fails, if it flops, you take your reputation down with it. <clears throat> and Washington was very, very touchy about his, his reputation. He wasn't that kind of man. George Washington doubled down. He was there the first day. He was willing to stake everything on this. Um, although, and his reputation and Franklin's reputation, these are the two best known, most trusted Americans. Their reputations alone may well have put it over the top. Just that and nothing else. Neither one of them made a, you know, a serious uh, substantive contribution to the final document. And Washington, as presiding officer, could not uh, participate in debate. But if for a lot of people who just weren't sure about this, if General Washington was there, if he thought it was okay, and Dr. Franklin was there, and he thought it was okay, well, it's good enough for me. So that, that, that may have been critical right there. Now, the other revolutionary leaders, for one reason or another, they're not there. Thomas Jefferson wasn't there, and he wrote the Declaration of Independence. He and John Adams both were over in Europe serving as diplomats. Adams would have loved to be there. Uh, he wanted in on it. That was his kind of game. And in fact, he wrote a lengthy essay, which was an attempt to give advice to the Constitution writers. And it was published in all the newspapers in Philadelphia after being carried across the ocean by ship. Nobody can find any of us that anybody read it. So whether he actually had any influence or not, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of relieved that Jefferson was not there. Jefferson has a radical side. You never know which which Thomas Jefferson you're going to get. Um, on the one hand, he could he could design beautiful buildings. He could design machines that would actually work. He could think all these high flown thoughts politically. But sometimes Thomas Jefferson's got both feet planted and firmly in midair, so he he might have spoiled it if he'd been there. Okay, uh, Samuel Adams and uh, Patrick Henry of Virginia both stayed out. They were chosen. They stayed. They didn't go. Um, both of them were afraid that what actually did happen was going to happen. That this was going to design a, a greatly strengthened new central government, which would undo everything the revolution had accomplished. And when the uh, Constitution writers went public with their work, which they didn't do till they were done, he confirmed all of. Uh, of uh, Patrick Henry's fears. Uh, he fought hard to keep it from being ratified. And once it was in place, he, as far as, uh, if I'm informed correctly, he switched sides and became a strong supporter. But when it was just in the offing, he famously said, I smell a rat. <laughs> okay, way to go, Patrick Henry. Um, so uh, there were only two major leaders there. Some of the men who did take the lead really hadn't been old enough yet at the time of the revolution. Now I'm going to introduce you to three younger delegates who played major roles in one way or another. And I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I don't want you to think this is the big, where is it, <laughs> big three uh, or anything like that. Um, but just, and there were older leaders uh, who contributed, but there were Three men just in their 30s who made big contributions. Now, that may sound old to you, but trust me, it's not that old. Okay, all, a list of men like that has to begin with James Madison of Virginia. He was quite a bit younger than Jefferson, but they were, they were, they were close friends. They're both in the same social class. And James Madison, somebody like him today, would be the prodigy that graduated from Ivy League school at the age of 15, something like that. This this guy, is, he's like five feet, four inches tall and all brain. Not really very sociable, kind of a high-pitched voice, but he's a genius. And uh, in preparation for this assignment, he read everything he could get his hands on about governments past and present in various ancient and modern languages. At his request, Jefferson sent him like a crate of books from France, and, and he read them all, and I'm going to put this on hold to Constitutional Convention Part 2.